And joining us now to discuss the ABCs of public sector accountability for the full hour, David Tabucci, former Ontario PC cabinet minister, Herschel Ezrin, former principal secretary to former Premier David Peterson, Richard LeBlanc, ethics and corporate governance professor at York University, Stephen Griggs, executive director of the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance, and there's Christina Blizzard in the middle, provincial affairs columnist with Sun Media. Good to have all of you alongside for tonight's discussion. We call our Thursday program your agenda because it's your agenda in tv land you are watching and we invite you to send us your emails your comments your questions for our assembled guests this evening we'll try to get to as many as we can if you want to email us do it at the agenda at tvo.org or you can reach us as well via twitter because as we all know everybody tweets today twitter.com slash the agenda lots of discussion on this topic so please jump in and join the debate also tonight our fifth column blogger mike minor We'll be hosting a live chat at our Inside Agenda blog site. That's at tvo.org slash the agenda. So again, log on. Let us know what you think. We'll run your comments uh, throughout the program on the bottom of the screen and get some of them to our guests as well. Okay. Over the past few months, Ontarians, we are told, are exercised about the fact that some public sector agencies are spending their money questionably. Uh, we know the famous example of the consultant making $2,700 a day and yet billing the government $1.65 for a Tim Hortons tea and $3.99 for Choco Bites. We know about the employee for the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Commission, count, uh, Corporation, excuse me, who had a health club membership paid for him as part of his compensation. We know about taxpayers reimbursing somebody for a car wash for $30 even though they didn't have a receipt. And we know, as we saw in the opening, about taxpayers reimbursing government employees for alcohol even though that's not usually covered in most circumstances. First question, when you heard all of this come out, Christina, what'd you think? I was, uh, I was frankly shocked. Uh, we got the receipts uh, delivered to us for a lot of the e-health stuff. A lot of it had been dribbled out in FOIs. Freedom I think of information requests. Freedom request. of information requests. But when you saw all of them, in a in thick binders, you, you realize that the, the length and breadth of how just how much was, was being charged here. I think some people think, you know, chocobites that, um, you know, cups of tea, a few hotel rooms, that perhaps it was just, you know, it, just a few things here and there that were a little bit outrageous. When you actually saw the binders, when, when we saw the alcohol, the, the dinners, the lunches, the breakfasts, you asked yourself, is anyone in this organization paying for their own food? Let me ask Dave Tabucci, because when you were management, your chair of uh, management board, right? That's right. Any time the government spent money, you had to approve it. That's right. So what did you think when you saw all this? Well, you remember also that we, uh, we brought in some legislation dealing with expenses for uh, the cabinet ministers and opposition leaders as well. I mean, uh, the real problem is this. Uh, you know, you can't really take the private sector standards and put them into the public sector because there is a difference. First of all, it's taxpayers' money. Uh, secondly, if you understand, there's a template of politics all over this as well. So what may not be a big deal, for example, buying a, a Big Mac in the private sector because you're actually saving maybe about $18, uh, people are going to look at that and, you know, you're probably saving taxpayers money by doing it, but they'll look and say, well, why don't you pay for that out of your own pocket? So the politics, no matter what's going to enter into this, and the big question is, are you creating by cumulatively or individually a big issue for the government? Stephen, what do you think? Well, I think most of these uh, Crown agencies uh, are trying to act like businesses. And I bring a business perspective perhaps to this conversation. And, and in business, you spend money to make money. Uh, so there are times, for example, where it makes sense to do client entertaining. Uh, sometimes that includes alcohol and, and other things. And in the business world, that is often quite acceptable. On the other hand, there's a huge range of acceptability within the private sector. Uh, you know, some companies think it's fine to have corporate jets and fly around. Others require you to go to the cheapest possible tango fare, no matter how far you're going. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize from a, a business perspective, there's a very wide range of acceptability. But as David said, there, in, in the public context, you have to overlay the reality that you are using public money. So the range can't be that wide in the public sector? I would say that's right. You would say that's right. Herschel, how about you? I think this is all about culture. The first thing I thought of when I heard these things happen was <laughs> I said to myself, not again. Because the reality is that you can write every rule that you want, but unless you change the culture of the way organizations work. And remember, most of these government organizations are monopolies or oligopolies of one kind or another, Let's which we make, don't make know. the list of rights. It's the Liquor Control Board of sure. Ontario, it's the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Commission, TDO, 
um, right. Ontario so, Hydro, well, what you well, call Ontario well, Hydro. Right, Hydro so One, as OPG. a result, it's not like they have the same competitive needs that a private sector business might have one way or the other. But I would say that you start, when Eleanor Kaplan was minister, uh, she did something, one thing that I will always remember, and really sent shockwaves in terms of the culture. She turned off the key, uh, the engines of cars that were idling because both it was partly environmental, but it was also you're wasting gas. If this is the taxpayer's money, and we're now talking about a period of time when we've gone through eight months or 10 months of absolute grief for everyone in the economy, people are not very amused by looking at a situation like this where people are spending money in a wasteful way when people don't have jobs. You know, it's funny, Eleanor Kaplan did that It's probably 25 years ago, almost 25 years ago, and 25 years later they're still talking about how she'd go out and turn the keys off of cabinet ministers' cars that were sitting there idling waiting for the minister to come out of a meeting. But it, it did send a signal, you're right. What do you say? The only I ironic thing I see is that the Ontario Securities Commission, which is responsible for regulating all the publicly traded companies in Canada, uh, three or four years ago has said to, to all TSX listed companies, we want to see a code of conduct, we want to see a board mandate, we want to see an audit committee mandate, we want to see position descriptions on your website. The New York Stock Exchange this week is having greater uh, disclosure requirements for its, its listed companies on its websites. And when you go to the websites of various Ontario uh, Crown corporations, the disclosure, and, and Steve, this, this would interest you uh, given your uh, <coughs> emphasis on, on shareholder right. disclosure, the disclosure is minimal at best. I mean, the Ontario uh, Lottery Gaming, and I said this about a year ago, had a, an audit committee disclosure that was three lines long. And that, in today's day and age, is wholly inadequate. So whether you're a shareholder on the outside or a taxpayer and you're looking in, the disclosure on, uh, of, of uh, corporate governance practices and, and policies and expectations is opaque at best. And, 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 and minimal, and in some cases wholly inadequate. David Tabucci, let me give a list of what seem to be the alleged improprieties here, and then I want to ask you a question coming sure. out of that. Requesting reimbursement for questionable expenditures seems to be one of the things people are upset about. Political favoritism, namely handing out, in some cases, untendered contracts to, agency, to you know, companies that are friendly to the government. Or number three, not properly following the procurement processes for the letting of those contracts uh, namely, you know, not tendering certain contracts that maybe ought to have been tendered. Of those three general areas, which is the one you think taxpayers should be exercised about the most? Well, you see, the problem is for government is that uh, you need to have a process in place. The, the, the government itself has a process in place in terms of procurement. It, the, the rules are very clear. Uh, they're very strict in terms of, of how you can actually get a government contract. Except when they're not. Yeah, but we're talking about the agencies now here. And, and, and the problem, I think, is maybe that, that protocol and that process the government has established to make sure that these things are not done properly hasn't been extended to the Crown agencies, which is really what needs to be done. Because at the end of the day, what the public needs to know that any contracts have been tendered out fairly and gone through a process is fair. Now, sometimes you might have a beef later on because someone's got a political friend in there or other, but if you're the government or you're an agency, you can default to say, here's the process. The process with the protocol was fault to the nth degree, mm -hmm. and therefore, yes, there are people who are associated with different yeah. parties from time Christine, to time. let me get you on that, though, because every his party did it, his party did it once upon a time. They all send contracts to companies that are friendly to them. That, that means to the victor I goes the sport. Yeah. No, 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 you no, never no. did, no. except you were the only two exceptions in the history of thank, the province, of course. Now it's on the record, it's good. <laughs> but everybody else did it. So which of those three things exercises you the most? I find the untended <laughs> contracts and, and some of the, the sole source contracts that we saw going to political friends to be perhaps one of the most troubling aspects. And I think that that is one of the reasons why uh, it's a little unfair to ax uh, the CEOs uh, in these cases, as has been done with both um, eHealth and with um, with Kelly McDougall at OLG, I believe that um, you know who profited from um, uh, any untended contracts to political friends. They, they're not um, not the CEOs, presumably, who are reasonably apolitical. It's the uh, it's the cabinet ministers who got those roles, and we all know if you look at. Uh, those ministries, uh, the people in them are generally people, who, the, 
uh, with leadership aspirations. Michael Bryant, who had leadership aspirations, was very upset. Part of the reason he quit was because he was put into Aboriginal affairs right after the 2007 election. For someone who has hopes of perhaps becoming a leader, that is not a place where you can raise any kind of money to, to run a, a campaign. That was one of the reasons why he was very upset, I believe, um, and, and why he subsequently quit. That's another story. But someone like George Smitherman, who we know has great political aspirations, um, was um, in charge of, uh, it was in the health ministry at the time that a lot of the e-health uh, contracts uh, came about. He was also uh, had, um, um, under his purview, uh, the OLG uh, at, at at certain times, and David, he and David Kaplan uh, have sort of switched those roles. David Kaplan is now the um, the health minister, but um, at one time he had OLG when, when OLG had its earlier problems. Uh, David Kaplan, who is the son of Eleanor Kaplan, who turned off the uh, cabinet <laughs> minister's all comes part. Circle. Uh, <laughs> There, there's a dirty little secret that we're also talking about when you talk about these kinds of Tell corporations. Us. Tell us. Well, it's very simple. A lot of times they were established mm -hmm. or their roles were enhanced in order for the government not to take the heat for certain decisions that were going to be made. And the trade-off was that you were going to appoint independent boards and that those boards were going to exercise true judgment and true review of what was going on as the means of protecting, in a sense, the politicians from certain decisions that were then made. Now, here's the problem. Were the boards doing their work? And I'm not blaming every board, I'm just asking the question. And then secondly, and more importantly, if something like this had happened on our watches, I can tell you the first time it happened, the bells would be ringing among public servants. I was, a, I was a career public servant for 15 years before I got into politics. And I can tell you, there would have been uh, people in the Secretary to Cabinet's office on the phone saying, I want in three days an oral report. I didn't say written, by the way. But an oral <laughs> report <laughs> about exactly what is going on in your agency and what needs to be done to make sure that we are obeying and following the processes so you, and rules. You'd ask who for that report? I didn't say that. I would ask that the public servants would be asking other public servants for those reports. I see. Can I, uh, Stephen, let me go to you with this. Sure. We found out, uh, you know, my hunch is in the private sector, if you're trying to get good people to come work for your company, you might, as an example, throw in a free membership at a local sure. gym Absolutely. in order to entice the person right. to come aboard. Right. We now have discovered that apparently if you do that in the public sector, mm -hmm. you're going to have it splashed in 60-point type on the front page of the Toronto Star, and you're, you know, you're ruined. Is that fair? Well, I, I think it, when you're dealing with political, uh, the polit political process, uh, there's a whole other set of, of uh, considerations. But in, in corporate Canada, it's certainly not unusual for you know, a senior executive to have a health club thrown in or something along those lines. And there are certain tax benefits to doing that. On the other hand, some of Canada's leading companies are, are moving much more towards a, here's, here's a certain dollar amount and you can get a car, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just keep it uh, very simple, but don't, don't dare to bring in uh, expenses for other things. Dave, does that offend you, the what? notion of offering a free gym membership to bring no. somebody aboard? No, not the private sector, but the difference is this. No, in an agency of the government. Well, see, here's the difference, though, Steve. The difference is this. Uh, in, in the private sector, the, the, the question has to be asked, are you complying to the rules? Are, are the rules are there. Are your expense rules being followed? Government, though, uh, is really, are you complying with the rules? Secondly, um, is it the right thing to do understanding the public scrutiny of what you're doing? And as you said before, are you going to be happy if whatever you're doing is going to be on the front page of the Toronto Sun mm -hmm. the next day? And the answer is no, even though you're allowed to do that, you shouldn't do it. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that you're playing by the rules? Well, Ultimately, that, that's it's the board question. of directors. Well, in, but not only that, but the question I in my mind is, is there an orientation for these people to say, you know, here's, here's what the template we have. Plus, by the way, in government itself, uh, cabinet ministers, the premier, you can't expense alcohol. So why Whose would, fault is that? I brought that in. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but why would you think that you could do that now right. at an agency level if you can't do it at the government exactly. level? I mean, there should be the one standard, and I give the Premier credit because he's trying to do something mm -hmm. to make sure that that universal rule applies. But that's why I say it's culture. This is about far more than just rules-based uh, approach to this. You've got to break a culture. Do you think there's a culture of entitlement in public <clears throat> sector agencies? I think there's a culture of entitlement 
across the board, many people have, and it's no different in public service ag in those agencies, and that's what we have to break. Stephen. You know, you talk about the concept of entitlement, and certainly in, in the corporate world, that has existed, and it's something that our organization representing large investors has been pushing very hard. Uh, so, for example, you, you, know, you see stories of CEOs having uh, exe executive jets, for example, or helicopters, or uh, chauffeurs, and all those kind of things. And that's really largely disappeared in, in corporate Canada. Certainly among the executives of car companies nowadays. Yeah. That's I right. I think they learned their lesson yeah. about that. <laughs> that's right. Richard, let me ask you this. Do you, as you analyze this, did it seem to you that these, you want to call them mistakes, improprieties, whatever you want to call them, do you think they happened because people were just out and out flouting the rules? <laughs> Or was it more a case of the rules weren't all that clear? No, I think the rules are, are, are there. It's, they need to be enforced and they need to be adequately insured by the board of directors and by the audit committee. But if the board is, not, is composed of uh, political appointees that aren't selected on the basis of uh, competencies and aren't um, in, uh, overseeing the, the risks and the internal controls and the internal audit and the external auditor appropriately, then you're going to have a culture of entitlement. And ultimately, the buck stops with the board of directors. And it, you have to go back to how the board is selected. You know, boards in the private sector now, there's a competency matrix so that you have to bring certain people on the board that understand the industry, understand uh, the business. Uh, you know, the Ontario Lottery Gaming Corporation had, it's a $6 billion corporation, and it had six directors, and I think their pay was, you know, $10,000 a year. You know, the government has to uh, impose the same sort of expectations on, on its own crown corporations that other provinces are doing and has to engage in, you know, bringing on the right people so that they can adequately oversee the controls and oversee uh, what's happening within the organization. So in my mind, the buck stops really with the board of directors. So just by way of comparison, if you were in the private sector running a $6 billion corporation and you were a board member, what would your compensation likely be? Anywhere between no. fifty and a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, for a corporation easily. that size. Absolutely. Not ten. Not ten. And, no, and you get what you pay for at the end of the day. And, and, and you would be spending a, a significant period of time in oversight. Probably twenty to thirty for a corporation that size. Twenty, probably twenty to forty working days a year. If you're, and, and that's just as a board member, not chairing a committee. Uh, so and, and plus, you're going to be fiscally literate on that on that you're board going to have as well. Financial literacy expectations Secondly, exactly. as you were saying earlier on. What, unlike government agencies, you're going to have a governance uh, committee, you're going to have an HR committee, you're right. going to have a, an audit committee. Everyone participates on these things, but it gives you a template of, uh, of, of accountability that mm -hmm. isn't necessarily there with the public sector. But David, we, we don't know that because if you go to the Ontario Crown Corporation websites, I mean, I had to drill down to the LB, LCBO to find out the board of directors in an annual report. The financial statements for the OLG were listed under the, the, the media uh, tab. And they just listed the directors. And if you go to any top uh, TSX 100 company, within two or three clicks, you can find out you know, who's the board, what, what competencies do they have, what meetings did they attend, what are the mandates of the committees. You don't find any of that why in not? the Crown Why do you suppose not? I don't know. Like, why won't the government, why won't the government, why won't McGinty impose, they haven't, impose, had, to. They haven't, they haven't had, to. had to. Well, let's do a little history lesson here. Herschel is now going to tell us, because of his vast experience in government, about what they call the ABCs of government. Agencies, boards, commissions, ABCs. Why were they created in the first place? What's their job? Well, as I, I said before, part of, some of them were created to uh, administer programs that they wanted to have at arm's length from the government Why themselves. would you want them at arm's length? because they took political decisions, or they were delivering money to regions of the province, for example. Why or they were politicians want to do that? Uh, politicians want to because they can still be there for the check handing over, but they don't have to be there for the formal reason of explaining to other people why they didn't get the money, but somebody else <laughs> did. Okay. <laughs> but Steve, it gives you some of the woodshed, too. So if something goes wrong, it's not the government doing it, it's the agency. Exactly. You're going to say, you know what, exactly. we're going to fix this. Okay, hold in, off on in, that, because that speaks to... Many yeah. of these were set up to have specialized expertise. So the Ontario Securities Commission, the Rent Review Committee, tribunals, those kinds of things are, are out there uh, where they're designed to create specialized administrative expertise. So I wouldn't say everyone was set up for you know, purely no, political but, reasons. But the big number ones, in many cases, were. Yeah. Well, you'd know better than me. <laughs> so <laughs> he actually is right. Let me read <laughs> Here's an editorial from a couple of days ago in your Toronto Daily Star, as we used to call it. All about this. Michael, if you would, let's bring this up. Crown agencies are kept at arm's length for two reasons. To avoid political interference, as Herschel said. For example, we don't want a cabinet minister deciding where to locate a new LCBO store or what movies, heaven for fen, TVO will broadcast. And to allow them to behave more entrepreneurially than the bureaucracy-bound government. Yet, at the first whiff of controversy, 
Politicians scramble to, quote, bring them to heel, in Dalton McGinty's words. The dilemma, then, is how to enable these agencies to be both nimble and apolitical while still holding them to the highest standard expected of the public sector. Now, ABCs have traditionally not been subject to the same oversight process as ministers and political staff, right? That's correct. Why not? Well, you know, I guess, I, I suppose it's, again, uh, uh, they never had to be. I mean, the, the real question is, that, for example, you look at the organizations that are in trouble right now, whether it's the OLG, uh, whether it, I mean, LCBO is not looked at right now, but people don't look at, a, at, at agencies, credit agencies that make money because mm -hmm. they assume because they're making money, they're doing things efficiently. Really, the question that's is, right. are you looking at the expense side as well? Right. And that's where I think the real scrutinizing has to, has to be now today. Let, let me follow up with Stephen on that because that is a, that's an excellent point. The LCBO, by having the monopoly on booze sales in this province, remits right. about a billion dollars to the right. provincial coffers. Right. The lottery and gaming, they, they've got the, you know, the monopoly on the casino zone. Six billion. Six billion, and the lotteries that they run as well. If you work for an agency of the Ontario government that makes money, mm -hmm. as opposed to one that doesn't make money, maybe you're entitled to have the taxpayer pick up your alcohol for the entertaining you do of clients over lunch. Is that possible? Well, you know, it, it seems to me it depends on the nature of their business. Uh, if you need to be entertaining clients, uh, which in both of those cases is probably not that likely, but you know, maybe maybe it is, uh, then it's probably reasonable that that things like alcohol not necessarily a lunch because nobody really drinks at lunch anymore, but it might be something that'd be a reimburse a reimbursable. You haven't hung out with journalists at lunch often. I guess no, <laughs> no. Uh, but you know, it seems to me that a lot of this is really pretty simple. You had all these crown agencies. Why isn't there? And I, I guess the premier is moving towards this. Why isn't it just one standard? Uh, you know, the boards, as, as as you mentioned, a lot of them are political appointees. Uh, they're not paid very much. They're I don't know how much is expected of them. Uh, unlike on a, on a traditional corporate board. Mm -hmm. Why not just have the government deal with some of these issues once and for all, as I think the Premier is moving towards, and bring them up to the standard uh, that the government expects? Christine, I want you to tackle that question. If you work for an agency of the Ontario government that makes a lot of money, that will end up going to build hospitals and hockey arenas and pave roads and all of that, should there be a different culture of expectation than if you work for an agency of the government that does not? No, I think it, I think it should be the same. I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think quite rightly, you know, there are different, if you're in the LCBO, clearly you're going to be meeting with um, liquor companies, you're going to be visiting wineries, one can expect you to be teetotal, and you're ex probably going to be expected to pick up the tab, although I expect if you're going out with liquor companies, surely they should be paying for the booze. In fact, I, I think I remember Andy Brand at one time, I think there was some criticisms in the Toronto Star at one time that he had um, um, been traveling uh, to uh, to a liquor company and, and the liquor company had paid. And he said, well, you know, I'm, you know, one way or the other, um, I'm not going to be paying for my booze, so why not have the liquor company pick up the tab, you know, rather than taxpayers? You know, aren't I doing you all a favor? And frankly, I quite agree with that. Dave Tabucci, inside government, when you saw the different roles for different agencies, did you think, well, th these guys are actually bringing a lot of money into our coffers. No, in fact, Maybe we should uh, cut them a break. Honestly, uh, back in government, I was trying to get an audit done of these agencies. Because? Because I <laughs> suspected at that time that, again, for the same thing, you never look at organizations that are bringing money in. I want to get back to the rules thing for a mm -hmm. second. I mean, look, if you look back what some of these individuals have done, I, I, I think they need to look at the rules because you look at some of the things they expense, they've probably been following the rules. Right. The rules allow that. What's here is bad judgment. So if bad judgment, again, don't, you follow the rules or not, legal or illegal, that's the lowest standard you can have. Mm -hmm. The real standard should be, are you doing the right thing? So maybe they need to look at the rules and understand what the lowest standard they're going to have. So maybe if they don't want these things on there, whether it's health clubs or whether it's other things like this, Make sure the rules reflect that. Do, because do you, do you think that untendered contracts and repeated? No, that, I'm talking about expense no. rules. Untendered no. contracts are bad. Right. That this is, is a government. Yeah. You need sure. accountability. Yeah. Right. I, I was going to just go back to uh, the tra a training concept here. Mm -hmm. When people join these agencies, if the standards are clear and the smell test is known and explained in advance, you have a better chance. You don't have a hundred percent chance, but a, but a better chance of making sure that people will start to exercise better judgment uh, through the process. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have. So when the, when the Premier talks about part of the solution, I think the other part is the training that has to go on for the people to understand the rules and to understand on an ongoing basis, not just once a year even. Richard. Well, if someone is trained on a board of directors in the, pub in the publicly traded sector, 
the requirements for disclosure now, you're even obligated to disclose your training record that you've done over the last year. We don't have any of that. From We don't understand how, how the education program works, how the training program works, what the expectations are, and, and, and why not? If you're coming on to a board of directors or, or an agency or, or a commission, um, how are you trained? It's interesting. I know I, I trained other uh, provinces on other crown corporations, 80 or 90 corporate directors in a room for a whole day. Is that happening on, in Ontario? We don't know. I doubt it. I really doubt it because you know what, unlike the corporate sector where you have to justify your choice to sit in that board, where you do have to bring skills that are going to advance the corporation, <clears throat> don't forget uh, the, the political uh, process involved yeah. with the selection of these people. I mean, these people are, I mean, they're political appointees. It doesn't necessarily mean in some cases they actually have qualifications. I, I find it kind of amusing. Well, that's frightening. That's I think that I think Dave makes a really yeah. good point because I, I think that the one of the big issues you, that constantly recurs in government is that um, government is co constantly bamboozled over IT on IT projects. They are constant. They constantly run over. They go over cost. Clearly. Um, and I know a lot of people who are in the IT business and who roll their eyes and they tell me that they're pretty sure that, you know, once again you have got large contracts, it's a lot of money, people are attracted to these kinds of contracts who don't necessarily understand the nuts and bolts of IT. Do you know the analogy I hear is that we're in an iPod world and the government is still building 8-track tape recorders, you know? Right. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I you think, can use a tape yeah. I mean, why, for example, are we uh, w building our own uh, e-health system when hmm. it's already been built in Alberta the IT you know people tell me up. you could, yeah. you know. Let's follow up on this, because this, this clearly was the biggest scandal over the summer. To, I shouldn't say scandal. This was clearly the biggest issue over the summer that raised the hackles of many people associated. Right. The public can decide whether it was a scandal or not. I do want to go through a bit of this now, though, because, uh, well, it's, it, it is a fascinating case study in, in just, the, you know, the shifting sands underneath the feet of people who came in under one set of rules and then quite, uh, quickly realized the rules had changed. Alan Hudson, I think by all accounts, is a very honorable guy who has a lot of expertise in the healthcare system. He was brought into a situation where the previous government's efforts to bring IT to e-health, $647 million later, had nothing to show for it, virtually nothing to show for it. So he came in under a set of circumstances where he could act fast, like a private sector company would. He could hire who he wanted, he could let contracts to who he wanted, he didn't have to tender everything. And once that became public, Suddenly, it's like uh, Claude Rains in Casablanca. I'm shocked to find all this is going on here. Did he get hung out to dry, Herschel? Um, he, may, he may have been, uh, earned uh, uh, a lot of extra criticism. But one of the things that, and I look at this also from a private sector experience that I've had, that you've got to apply is there's a risk matrix that any CEO or any board is looking at when they're looking at projects. And if you know that there are certain, you, you try to minimize the risk and you try to build in certain uh, factors into what you do. And to say that you're going to throw everything at this project and now fix it isn't any better management than trying to do it in a, in, in a, uh, a narrow fashion. And so, so would you I, say he had a tin ear to the political realities of the day? I think that uh, he would uh, be, uh, would have benefited from having a very strong group around him who was prepared to push back. And I think that Dr. Hudson was in a situation where he was asked to fix a problem but didn't have that kind of support system. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you say you should do something. And, and again, uh, you look at the OLG as an example. Uh, you've got someone who came in to fix the situation. Uh, I mean, I, when this happened, I said to a friend of mine, I said, yeah, the problem here is not so much that she has no... Not now that's a first. That's a first. We got a fire alarm going off in the middle of the program. Is somebody smoking in one of the other bathrooms yeah. around here or something? <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't to, to do with the hot air we're generating here as well. But, uh... Hopefully we'll get the building people on top. Okay, I guess it's done. Yeah. You, you are one hot dude, Dave. To be sure. oh, that's no, what happened. No, uh, yes, you can see it from the top of his head. It's just rising. <laughs> well, that's because you can see the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you were saying. Oh, I lost my train of thought when that happened. Jeez. But, but uh, you know, again. Just because you can do it doesn't no, mean you should do you it. You see, the problem is it wasn't so much that the new CEO didn't understand the gaming world, no experience in gaming. But the problem here was it didn't understand how government functions. And the accountability was back to government. 
And right. if you're running an agency like this, you got to be thinking somewhere in the top of your head, don't create bad issues for the minister, okay, especially but, the minister's George. But Steve, <laughs> let's try this. If, if this were a private sector analogous situation, right. You're bringing in a new CEO to clean up the mess of the previous guys, and you know you know he's going to have to break some eggs to make this omelet right. because the mess is big. Mm -hmm. You know, my hunch is he'd be hailed as a hero in the private sector for coming in and showing such quick decisiveness, and yet here, he was out. Well, you're talking about e-health. I'm talking about e-health. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, yes and no. Uh, if you looked at some of the, I'm not certainly not an expert. If you look at some of the untendered contracts, they had absolutely nothing to do with creating an e-health system. They were about media relations and. Uh, those kinds of things, which it's actually someone got paid overtime to watch this program, which right. sounds like a which very is wise a wonderful expenditure. Idea. <laughs> yeah. The rest uh, of it, I mean, some of it, enjoyable. Not to, <laughs> some of those expenses were were rather perplexing, and, and maybe he was trying to to be very sensitive to the political issues uh, by by doing that. Uh, but uh, you know, someone coming in to make change needs time and needs support from the board and and from their shareholders. But Christina, my hunch is that over the years you've written a number of columns that have suggested, boy, if only these bureaucracies would act with a little more private sector, roll up your sleeves and elbow grease and get to it, and then when they try to do that, they get killed for it. Well, I, I, I think there is a difference. I, I, I mean, in the private sector, we do have, um, a, there is a board of directors that would certainly not allow uh, these things to happen or would demand a certain accountability. You have shareholders who expect, um, you know, who expect their shares to show them some value, um, uh, you know, some dividends out of that. Whereas you don't have that. You don't have shareholders. You have you, you have taxpayers asking questions, but uh, not in the same direct way. And I, and I think that, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think that one of the problems actually I think was uh, came about as a result of uh, Dave's something that Dave's government did when they uh, brought about public salary disclosures I think what happened there was if you go back to the first year those came out the volume is that thick of people who make a hundred thousand dollars on the public dime yeah, now it's like this it's there's several volumes that size what happened everyone looked at the guy in the next office was making a hundred thousand dollars and went into their bosses in the public sector and said I want a hundred thousand dollars too if that guy's making it no one knew how much so, everyone so the, the fact that we're spending more on public servants today we can blame the Mike Harris government you yeah. only have to look at <laughs> those well, we books for everything anyway, <laughs> so. but you can't, go ahead but you have to uh, note that you can't just blame this as a government problem Ask bank presidents. The best thing that ever happened to them was the publication of salaries because all of a sudden there was an escalation of uh, nuclear proportion in terms of people's salaries. Up. It ratcheted yeah. everybody yeah. up. Well, no, no, no board thinks they have an average CEO. Right. right. Or right. certainly no, no For long. Blow that's, that's, CEO. <laughs> no, that's true, though. But that's we just, true. Richard, that's we just true. got an email come in a second ago that said we're so focused on the $7 cost for donuts, we've lost the bigger picture here, which is, are these agencies actually doing an effective job for us, which presumably is what, at the end of the day, we ought to care about. Is That's that person right? right? We're not looking at, you know, the cost of a paper clip or the cost of Timbits. It's the, it's the untendered contracts. It's the lack of, it's, it's what happened with OLG with the lottery tickets. It's, it's, the, it's the risks. It's the uh, financial impropriety. It's, it's where, who was, who is at the helm and how did they get there and what are their responsibilities and, how, and are they qualified and what are they doing their job? If you look at any major corporation in Canada, you can tell that. You, you can't tell that by looking at the, at and, the Ontario and government. This all then comes to a whole question of metrics when you're dealing with monopolies and oligopolies. Because what are the metrics going to be that you measure performance against? I mean, how do we know if Ontario Lottery Corporation, Gaming Corporation, could have sold more tickets or had a better profit? Uh, how are we judging that? And that's part of the challenge that we have looking from the outside uh, in. But you know what? Let me, let me follow up on that. You, you can probably tell if LCBO or OLG are doing a better job because they're taking in more money. That's, that's one simple metric to determine. Not, necessi not necessarily. But what about, what about OPG? Or what about Hydro One? Or how about this place? How would you measure the effectiveness of those kinds of agencies? Maybe it's a little tougher. Uh, it, it's tougher, but there are still metrics that can come because we can measure uh, your performance, for example, against PBSs. I, I don't mean you personally, but, uh, but, the, but TVO, <laughs> against uh, uh, PBS or against public networks in, in other places and see how many people you're reaching, understand uh, the nature of the, of, the, uh, of the impact that's going to be made. But, but I really think that when you look at profit, you've got to also relate it to cost.
mm. and that's the that's the uh, the ratio that go uh, that government doesn't do as well as the private sector. Sure. Chris. Um, one thing I, I think one of the problems with OLG was these revelations came hard on the heels <laughs> of a very damning report, very scathing report uh, by the ombudsman Andre Moran when uh, we we had this awful um, situation where the uh, there was one particular lottery winner who uh, didn't get what most people and what the uh, ombudsman clearly thought he should have, um, and other cases in which it was, you know, there were questionable practices by um, by lottery uh, ticket retailers. So uh, this, all these other revelations came hard on the heels of this. If Perhaps the Lottery Corporation had been innovative and, and had had no complaints and everyone was winning massive, <laughs> you know, jackpots and there weren't any legally. questions. Legally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think people would have said, you know, would have not been quite as upset about these revelations. A lot of it is timing, isn't it? I mean, journalists, we just ran it through our library system, you know, OLG, what, just to remind ourselves, oh, yes. <laughs> but that, that was a year ago, and the media scrutinized, and ex other people scrutinized, and what, what has happened in a year? What, what, what has happened at OLG in a year? If You're anything, saying not enough. Not enough, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay, Let's, uh, we're going to move into Chapter 3 of our discussion here. We're calling Politics, Econ Economics, and Responsibility. And we got this comment uh, via Twitter on this topic. Part of the problem, the tweeter says, is the focus on, quote, accountability rather than, quote, responsibility. And Dave Tabucci, let me get you to kickstart a discussion we're going to have on that. Agencies exist, I guess, in part to provide services to Ontarians in a way that does not tinge them with the day-to-day -day vagaries of, you know, partisan politics in this province. If that's the case, how responsible can a minister be for what goes on in an agency under his or her jurisdiction? Oh, ministerial responsibility. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, in a way, it's a little unfair that you have a minister who is supposed to be arm's length with decisions being made and, and these agencies. But the reality is, uh, it's politics. So ultimately, someone has to be responsible that to, to the people. You've got the agencies who are non-elected. Um, so someone in the chain of command has to be responsible for it. Now, understand as well that the minister uh, may not be involved with the day-to-day -day, uh, operations, but they do report to the minister. Okay, but let me follow up on that. G give me one portfolio you had, not management port. What else did you have? Uh, well, I was a consumer minister. Consumer. Yeah. So, g give me an agency that was under your aegis when you were consumer. LCPO. <laughs> LCBO. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. Yeah, now. Yeah. Did, you, did you at some point wonder, something's going on there that I we don't did like? We review of the LCBO when I was there. But you uh, couldn't in terms of the supply chain, for example. But can you, you can't really tell them, though, how to do their business, can no, you? No, it's not your job. I mean, again, and yet you're the, responsible the, the, for the whatever goes on there. That's unfortunate. That's the way it is. Ministers are responsible for policy, creation of policy. That's what politicians are. The implementation of that policy is by the civil service. But who appointed case, the board when, when you were there? Yeah, the board well, of the LCBO, in our case, I inherited it from the previous government, so Bob Ray appointed a lot right. of people around there. But, but, but the responsible minister but is to yes, appoint the, the board. The minister right. Right. is responsible for making recommendations. But the premier appoints uh, the board of the LCBO. You know, you know, right. I mean, the cabinet, maybe on your so cabinet, cabinet does. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, the other day, like, I was, I was kind of curious when I was watching the press uh, conference in terms of the, these agencies and the big question of the premier, and he was trying to distance himself from the appointees, but one of the reporters uh, was smart enough to say, well, didn't you appoint all these people? Uh, isn't there some responsibility? Because you, you can't look at the previous governments now. You've been in government for 60 years. Mm -hmm. y these are your people. So what are you doing here? Now, to his credit, he's taking some measures. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, ministerial responsibility um, was on a pedestal 30 and 40 years ago. And I'm afraid that it fell off that pedestal a while ago, both the federal and provincial and municipal levels uh, of politicians being responsible. We've, we now have a litany of blaming uh, civil servants for things that were done. We have a litany of other things that have happened. And I, I think it's a nice theory, but I don't think it's the reality of the way the system works as it used to. Can, I, mean, just, can I just understand what that means? Do you mean, you mean ministers don't I mean, quit anymore? I in, mean, in, in, in so Britain, the in the, yeah, in, in Britain, I remember when ministers would take the fall because there was a confidential document that was somehow left by one of their civil servants in a in a bathroom or something. I, I don't want to use any examples of things that might have happened in Canada recently, but nonetheless, there are lots of examples where ministers have not uh, taken that respons ministerial responsibility the same way because they obviously were not 
not at fault for the action that was taken, mm. and they then in chose to interpret it that that meant that they didn't have to do it. Can I just jump in here? Because sure. I, I'll look at our, our government, for example. You have a number of cases uh, in our government where ministers did not do anything personally. Uh, I'll remind you, Bob Runciman, where uh, the name of a, a young offender was, uh, was, was, was raised. It wasn't Bob's fault. I think it came through the civil service. Bob stepped aside. Jim Wilson, a similar uh, action. So you do have cases where the ministers uh, do have, I believe, the, the ethical behavior to say, look, even though I'm not responsible, we all know I'm not, but someone has to take responsibility for it, and some of my former colleagues did. In which case, let me ask uh, Christina this question. I went to see Tim Hudak speak today. He gave his first major speech as the new leader of the Ontario PC Party. And one of the things he said was, some minister's head's got to be on the chopping block for all of this. And if you fire one minister, boy, the others are going to pay attention pretty quickly, and this problem will clean itself up. Do you agree with that? I, I agree with him, you absolutely. you think someone's got to get fired over this? I, I absolutely believe that, uh, that um, a minister should have quit or been axed some time ago. Even though uh, they're not directly no, responsible? No, absolutely. No, because as Dave said, I mean, I can remember Bob Runsman quitting the building with tears in his eyes over um, a throne speech. He had not written the throne had speech. Nothing to do with it. Had mm. nothing to do with it, but it was a young offender was identified, and that was his ministry, and he left because he understood that that was the importance of the institution and the ministry and what had happened. And the integrity of the government, too. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the minister is not responsible for what has happened at OLG and eHealth. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you that, that, that the minister is not responsible if that's what you're saying. Are you, are you suggesting that? Because I think I'm the not minister is responsible. Anything. I'm, saying that, I'm saying that these agencies are in a kind of a, a, a never never land here. They're not, the, the people who work for these agencies are certainly not as, the minister is not as directly responsible for them as he the, would be the over the appoints, person in his own bureaucracy. The, the, the minister appoints the board of directors. Well, he just said that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you inherit a board. Well, but in this case, they've been government for six years, so doing, yes. But, but if they're not <laughs> yes. doing their job, yes. you know, there is the prerogative of the government to take action right. against the people who are on the board. That exactly. prerogative yeah. still yeah. remains. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a good point here because this new board, or this, this board was there when the previous action took place. They have to understand they're under more scrutiny now because of the, the past occurrence, less than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the new CEO came in to clean this up. So if you don't understand, this is your job right now to be more accountable then you're missing the boat on this one. Stephen, maybe you could you're give right. us a, a bit of a perspective from the private sure. sector on this one. And again, we just got somebody sending us in an email saying, I thought these current corporations were all stacked, the boards of these corporations were all stacked with political loyalists to the government of the day as a reward for doing good deeds for that party somewhere along the way. Is, the, is that, in fact, the perception in the private sector of who staffs these boards? Well, my colleague over here, David, is saying, yes, that's in fact what, what is happening. I shouldn't say anybody, well, actually, not <laughs> <laughs> smiling. Uh, I, mean, I think there, there certainly is a perception that uh, many of these boards are filled with people who have uh, relatively little experience, certainly with the business of the, of the agency, uh, and that many of them are there for political reasons. Um, on the other hand, I think there are examples of uh, boards that have people on them yeah. who do have legitimate ex business experience or experience in that industry, and that's, that's a very positive. Uh, yeah. Just an example, the Premier of British Columbia, the government of BC has said, listen, we want a completely competency-based recruitment and appointment process for all boards, crown boards in our province. Saskatchewan is another province where they're actually saying we're going to hold, and Saskatchewan, for example, is holding itself responsible for the OSC guidelines for its crown boards. So I think that, that the irony is that you should, you should hold your, you can't throw stones if you live in a glass house. You should hold yourself responsible you for what you're... You can have competency guidelines at the same time. Don't forget, there's right. going to be a lot of people who are competent to these jobs. Yeah. Absolutely. Who, who may then... They can be friends. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and maybe, absolutely. But they friends. should, they yeah. should yeah. actually and, and be... I think that there is a lot more competency that in the appointments yeah. than there used to be uh, 20, 30 years ago, yeah. honestly. Uh, you know, you, you do look where, at people because, you know, know? They're sub know, because they're subject to the appointments, they're subject to a, a committee uh, of, of the legislature, which is uh, stacked with opposition uh, members who will then, right. they really put the people to the hot seat. Right. Uh, it is okay. true. And, and, yeah, but I was going to say that uh, I, I don't want to pick on, on all of the people on, on these boards because of the fact that many of them are competent and we shouldn't criticize them because they have political loyalties either. It's the competency that's the issue. It's not whether or not okay, they have a political I'm, loyalty. I'm going to presume upon our 25-year friendship here to yeah. ask, to, this is not an academic discussion for you, this is a personal discussion. Sure. In that green room right now yeah. sits your wife watching right. this show. 
She's on an agency of an Ontario government, right? That's right. She's yeah. on the board of Trillium? Trillium. Which gives out, what, a billion dollars a year to worthy... No, 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 no. How much? hundred million? hundred million. hundred million. million. Sorry, million. over there. I always exaggerate everything by yeah. a factor of 10 to make it sound better. <laughs> um, how'd she get the job? She was chosen and appointed, and I'm sure that her, uh, her name came up through a, a process, but it's interesting that when she's been on the, uh, on the board of that agency, for, and she's been on now for, for two terms uh, of the agency, she's a very religiously active woman in terms of uh, uh, bringing her skills and expertise uh, with the areas of expertise that she has as a, as a registered psychologist, a psychologist and also a certified management consultant. And she does have the qualifications to be on the board. So. We all know that, and I wanted to give you a chance to say that. And now we're, you go. we're getting personal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Christina, though, as you've looked at these appointments over the years, yes. would you say the majority of them are like Herschel Ezrin's wife, who are competent and capable and may have some partisan affiliation, although I don't know if she does, but may have some partisan affiliation to the government of the day, or not? Well, I, I, think, I, I, you know, I think there's good and bad. I mean, you see... You know, you see truly honorable people being appointed to positions, and you think that's you know that's great. That's what the whole thing was about. And then, and then, sometimes you look in hindsight at at you know when some revelation such as uh, the OLG or EL or whatever comes about, and you start to probe a little further, and you find that there are people on the boards who perhaps you know whose names we all recognize and we all know exactly what they cr contributed to that political party and we they sort ran of, and lost in the last election yeah for example. exactly and we all mm -hmm. sort of laugh and chuckle but every party does this um, and you know perhaps that is you know perhaps that's the problem perhaps they should not be political appointees, but I'm not quite sure how a system would come about, a political system such as this would come about where you didn't have hmm. a political Let me follow up with you, Richard, on that. Are you saying that anybody who's appointed to an agency board or commission in Ontario should not have any tinge whatsoever of political no, association? No, I think, I think you have both. I think you have the government prerogative, you have the political aspect, but you also have the competency aspect. And I think that the, the, the uh, trick is to marry the two. And you no doubt will have political, you know, competencies. But if you fulfill the, if you understand the business, if you're, you know, uh, financially literate, if these these corporations are major, significant, uh, including the not-for-profit um, uh, uh, aspects of our economy, and they oversee resources, they oversee uh, very important aspects, and and it's absolutely critical that we have the right people at the helm and that they be selected properly. So I think government is going through a transition right now where it's saying. Listen, we, we have this political process. We've always used it, but the world is changing. We've got technology. We've got risk. We have to, you know, incorporate some of these best practices into our own appointment system. Stephen? Uh, I was just going to say that, you know, that some of these obviously are political appoint appointments, and that's part of the process. On the other hand, uh, the Ontario Securities Commission announced, I think it was yesterday or the day before, three new commissioners who are the equivalent of directors. Uh, I don't know any of these individuals, but based on their qualifications, it's, they're, they seem to be outstanding. They're, one's a retired judge, one is an expert in derivatives, which is one of the huge issues uh, globally, Absolutely. and another is a retired uh, chief financial officer. So, you know, I think we've got to be careful to, to think that it's that not everybody who's involved in, in this agency, process. If you don't have the competency, it's, it's very evident. That's a huge mm -hmm. wart in your right. face. Right. That, another one in particular. That's right. We've got less than five minutes to go here, and I want to just spend that time talking about the list of new things that Premier McGuinty has put out to ensure that uh, the rules are known and that the culture out there, as Herschel refers to it, changes. So, Michael, if you would, let's bring this list up. Uh, the Premier says, going forward, Ontario's largest arm's length bodies will no longer have final approval of their own expenses. Employees at Ontario's largest agencies, boards and commissions, the ABCs, will have expenses reviewed by Ontario's Integrity Commissioner. The province will undertake an external review of the 600 arm's length bodies to ensure they are being held accountable. Employees who claim unacceptable expenses, such as personal items and alcohol for staff functions, will repay the taxpayers. Dave Tabucci, what do we think? Well, first of all, Lynn Morrison's going to be very busy. She's the integrity, integrity commissioner. commissioner. With a staff of how many? Uh, yeah, Six? It's very small. <laughs> but she's very competent. She's yeah. very good. But... Where's, where are we talking about reviewing the rules to make sure the rules do work? I mean, I think that's what got us in trouble in the first place, that, that we have rules that no one really understood. It led to a lot of flexibility. But this uh, is clear, don't you think? Well, I don't think well, what those, I don't think it goes far enough. It's after the, first of all, it's after the fact. Secondly, it's mostly focused on expenses. 
I mean, if you're talking about accountability, responsibility, and all the rest, it's got to be in a lot more than um, just looking at the expense of uh, chits. Tender on tender contracts. Yeah. Bring that under the legal. And integrities are with a staff of six oversee expenses for 600 a ABCs. Yeah, yeah. You know, are you going to be sending in receipts for <laughs> your parking ticket yeah, to an integrities are? I mean, yes, how will that be? Exactly. That's exactly what the job will require well, now. Yes. Chris? I, I, well, and who who reviews the integrity commissioner's expenses as well. <laughs> but I, I, I think that that is, they're going to have to hire another two integrity commissioners. Or Chris, it was a nightmare when they had to just review the cabinet minister's okay. expenses and the premiers and the opposition leaders. So there's no way they can do this with the current uh, staff. Well, no that way. also seems no ridiculous way. that you need yeah. to create a whole new bureaucracy yeah, to be exactly. reviewing expenses that should be reviewed at each individual agency. Exactly. If you had standardized rules as to what's acceptable and what isn't, uh, err on the side of caution and mm -hmm. don't submit a Timbits bill or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly don't have things like health clubs and things that are politically very sensitive. But the government uh, is trying to look purer than Caesar's wife right now. Would you agree? I mean, this is what's... Right, but 600 agencies. I had personally yeah. had no idea there you were that many it. well, agencies. Well, it says here, yeah. you should review the expenses of the, I guess it's the 23 largest, not necessarily all 600, although... <coughs> But an what's the difference review? between somebody at the it's LCBO huge. versus some obscure <laughs> agency? But Chris. also, yeah. I, I mean, it really is the job of the minister to have control over this. And I think that all they're doing by sending it to the Integrity Commissioner is just you know, giving giving someone else, uh, you know, saying, no, this is, we, we've done this, this is an arm's length. Passing the buck? Yes, yeah. just p passing, passing the bureaucratic the, buck. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so that in future, if there are questionable expenses, well, it was passed by the Integrity Commission. It had nothing to do with exactly. us. It should be the minister. If you, if the minister doesn't take uh, responsibility, who will? Herschel, i got 30 seconds yeah. left, and you're the right guy for this question. During an economic uh, downturn, the ground always shifts. Why do politicians, who are usually so well attuned to what's going on in the air, always seem to be the last to adapt to the new reality of the ground underneath them? Uh, <laughs> If we all knew the answer to that, uh, we would be in office forever, is the simple, is the simple response. And, and, and the truth is, politicians are normal and human just like everybody else. Gotcha. That's why I went to you, because I knew you'd put a button on it just beautifully. Uh, can I thank, for being on the program today, uh, Christina Blizzard from Sun Media in the middle of Stephen Griggs on the right and Richard LeBlanc on the left from the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance and York University, respectively. And on the other side of the table, the former PC Cabinet Minister David Tabucci and David Peterson's former Chief of Staff, Herschel Ezrin. Thanks, everybody, for a great discussion tonight. Much appreciated. Now, for more information about tonight's guests and a list of the 23 agencies and commissions that will be affected by the new provincial oversight rules, please visit us online at tvo.org slash the agenda. Tonight's program was produced by our new Your Agenda producer, Naveen Viswani. Thanks, Naveen. And our fifth column blogger, Mike Miner. And you could read Naveen's thoughts on exorbitant expense accounts. That's on our Inside Agenda Producers blog at tvo.org slash the agenda. And while you're there, please have a look at my blog. Tim Hudak, as I mentioned earlier, gave his first major address as the relatively newly minted Ontario PC Party leader today. Hudak set out the Conservatives' chief priorities as the Ontario legislature gets set to reconvene on Monday. For more on the Tory strategy, please read my blog. Once again, all of that at tvo.org slash the agenda.